No, thanks. Yeah. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing better than me. Oops. <laughs> Hi, everybody. <laughs> Microphones are on. <laughs> it's all right. When, you, when you're talking. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the April 16th Town Council meeting. Tonight's meeting is the public hearing on the town budget. May I have the Deputy Mayor please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Would the town clerk please take attendance? Councillor Breton? Here. Councillor Forrest? Here. Councillor Hurley? Here. Councillor Latina? Here. Councillor Lesser? Here. Councillor Rell? Here. Councillor Spinella? Here. Deputy Mayor Martino? Here. And May Mayor Morin Bello? Here. Thank, Thank you. you. Tonight's meeting will begin with a presentation by Mike Emmett, Superintendent of Schools. I'd like to thank board staff and the Board of Education members who are here in the audience this evening. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. While we're getting ready, I would just like to remind everybody that there's a sign-up sheet on the side table. If you're speaking tonight, please sign in on the sign-in sheet. Thank you. Now, thank you for the opportunity to uh, be before you this evening. I have a uh, condensed version of the presentation that uh, we provided on the uh, town council meeting on March 19th. Um, obviously, uh, the Board of Education budget is one that makes up the majority of the budget here in the town of Wethersfield. Um, and certainly that the Board of Education budget is one that is extraordinarily important as it is part of the fabric of our town. Providing a high quality educational system for our students is an obligation that we have and it's one that we take very seriously. I want to talk about the board approved budget increase. Um, I started off with the superintendent's budget. Superintendent's budget uh, called for an increase in spending. Uh, of 3.97% over the adjusted 17-18 uh, budget. The Board of Education through del deliberations has shaved that down to a 3.49% increase. Uh, I want to make it clear here with regard to the amended budget. The amended budget is um, the result of ECS reductions that we faced over the course of this year. Unprecedented ECS reductions that we've never seen before. Um, this hit the town to the tune of approximately 1.335 million, of which the board was responsible for 742,000. The increase in our operating budget proposed for 1819 is $1,991,780. So what does that represent? Primarily, it is contractual obligations and benefit requirements. Also, mix in some state and federal mandates, our contribution to OPEB, which is increased again, as well as our fixed costs, transportation, tuition, and utilities. One of the things that I wanted to share this evening um, and follow up on what we talked about on March 19th was the idea of, of the board really trying to be innovative um, with ever-shrinking dollars, ever-shrinking resources, talking about um, developing in-house programming to serve our students. So I'd like to take a brief moment and talk with you about our plan with regard to special ed programming. One of the things you'll see in an upcoming slide is a pretty significant increase in tuition for students requiring special needs services that are beyond what we can provide in district. What we're looking to do is to develop in-house programming. The Board of Education has approved the development of two programs <coughs> that are self-contained here in district. One is an ABA, Applied Behavioral Analysis Program for our students with autism. And the other is called the STRIVE program, and it's for our students that um, have some traumatic issues and some uh, emotional issues. Typically, we would send these students out to outplacements at a huge cost to us for tuition and transportation. Here in developing these programs in-house, we end up keeping the kids in district where they get better quality education. We reduce the transportation costs, and we give the kids an opportunity to succeed in their neighborhood schools. 
What we'll do here, instead of coming to you and requesting more money to do this, we're going to take the tuition dollars that we save with these outplacements and we're going to reinvest it in the teaching staff for this particular program. Very proud to say that already we have two students that we have projected to go out that will be remaining in district in these programs. So this is kind of the same model that we've used with our transition academy as well, where we can provide the support to our students without them having to go out at an extensive cost to the district. I also want to be clear with you in saying that the process of special education is exorbitantly expensive. That's not just here in Wethersfield, that's across the state. And it, I know it's a challenge in some of our neighboring towns as well. So we're looking to be innovative and to reallocate our scarce resources to provide services to kids in districts. So very proud of these programs. We're in the process of getting them up and running. We'll have them ready to go in September. This is a graph that just speaks to the summary by major object. Uh, this has been consistent over the past uh, six years since I've been superintendent, and that is that the salaries and benefits are the primary driver of our budget. So 63.8% for salaries, 14.79% for benefits. And then this, I thought this slide was extremely important. This is the increase by major objects. So you can see the, the three drivers of that $1.991 million increase. You're looking at personal services salaries. You're looking at other purchase services, that's transportation and tuition. And you're looking at personal services, that's the benefits. Right now we're projecting an increase on the health insurance of uh, 6% over the, uh, the current <coughs> budget. We've done well with health insurance over the past couple of years, and uh, I believe we were at about a 14% increase originally, and we have uh, been able to get that down to 6% at this point in time. And then again, this is the, the, the last slide, and this just you know, shows you over the course of the past five years the budget increases that we faced. Um, you know, one of the things that we've had here with the contractual increases, we are in the process of negotiating with secretaries and paraprofessionals currently. We'll be engaging with nurses in the spring. Uh, in the spring, we'll also be engaging with custodians as well. So we look to find savings wherever we can. Um, our Weathersfield Administrators Association did take a hard zero, both with steps and salary increase, which I think speaks to the leadership of this group. Um, so we see some savings there. Um, looking at this from the long term, we are not naive to the fact that the state is still in dire straits financially. We're well aware of that. We also have to look at making sure that we're providing funding that is adequate for our programs. We have expectations here in Weathersfield, expectations for extracurricular activities, expectations for high quality instruction, uh, expectations for safe and secure buildings, and of that we are extraordinarily proud. The work that you've done with regard to support with capital improvement funds, we have surveillance systems in every one of our schools, and we have a direct tie into the Weathersfield Police Department. We have a director of security. We have security staff at the high school, the middle school, and through our partnership with the police department, we are fortunate to have two SROs. Where other districts are just looking at these means of safety and security, we've had them in place for a couple years. We're extraordinarily proud of that. We're extraordinarily proud of the opportunities that our students get from a perspective of theater and arts, music, sports, extracurricular activities. And we feel that this budget, albeit at a 3.49% uh, increase, this maintains the programs we have and it maintains the staff we have. We're not looking for additional positions at this time without looking for other areas of savings first. So with that, it's my presentation this evening, and I certainly look forward to the comments coming forward from uh, members of the public this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, Deputy Mayor Martino, and Town Council members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the following is a presentation of the overall budget, which includes what you just heard from Mr. Emmett. Um, so we'll get started. We're going to start with the current year, um, and I'm going to kind of go through some numbers for you. By charter, the town has to adopt its budget by May 15th of each year, and as we as we adopted our budget in the current year, the state did not have a budget. 
So we uh, took some estimates, we used some numbers that we uh, had and put together a budget and adopted on May 15th, knowing full well it was going to change. Um, in October of 2017, the state of Connecticut adopted a state budget, which caused significant changes in the town's assumptions. And by state law, they allowed towns to reopen their budgets and readopt, which we did on November 3rd, 2017. So on November 3rd, 2017, we adopted what we are calling in the proposed budget for next year, the current year budget. <coughs> so the November 13th, 2017 budget is the town budget according to what we're working from this evening. However, after we adopted that budget, uh, the governor decided that we had way too much money and held back another 800,000 plus. Um, and rather than amend the budget again, uh, both the town staff and the board, BOE staff and the governing body and the Board of Education uh, put together what we call, what we're calling the deficit mitigation plan to address the holdbacks uh, from the governor's office. So from there you can see the evolution of what our spending plan is. So we've gone from an adopted budget of 1.17 million, 101.728 to about a hundred million dollars. Um, and that's where we are today. But the adopted budget is the November 13th, 2017 budget. Okay, so as we use that as a base, these are the changes uh, into next year. The total increase in spending is 2,889,000. Uh, Mr. Emmett is using some numbers that are after holdbacks, so we are using the adopted budget. We, we're both on the same page, we're just having a different starting point, but our numbers are consistent and coincide. So you can see the 289 is the total spending increase, and you can see by the bar chart, the uh, total overall townwide increase is 2.85% in spending. Um, this is the mill rate proposed for next year, 4134. Um, this is a product of both the 2.85 increase in spending and the loss of millions of dollars of state aid over the past couple years. As we look to uh, these numbers, just we have to keep in mind that the state hasn't solved their current year deficit of over $200 million, so that is still an item that may be on the table uh, for further municipal aid cuts. And there's no adopted municipal aid budget for next year, so these uh, numbers we're working from are in the governor's budget, whether or not they will come to fruition or reality or some, uh, some modification thereof is yet to be seen. Um, grand list information, we had slight grand list growth uh, for the for next year, 0.38%. One mil, uh, based upon the taxable value of the town, one mil equals $2.192 million. So to move the dial, one mil, uh, you have to find $2.192 million. Um, with the average assessed value of a house, taxable value of a house in Weathersfield at $169,000, $400, uh, the mill rate increase as proposed on the average home in Weathersfield would equal $266. Um, state aid projections, uh, this is the FY1718 budget as adopted. This is prior to holdback. And the biggest uh, holdback you're going to see is on the, uh, the ECS grant, and I'm going to highlight it. If no, please wait. Oh, thank goodness. That would have been bad. I know. I'm sorry. You don't want to hear it? I love this part. Okay. So this number here, the eight million eight, that was uh, that's the pre-holdback number. That number right now is about eight million after holdbacks. So that's the biggest difference between uh, the municipal aid and uh, what's happening with holdbacks. And then you can see we go back up to 8.6 million, but you see the swap out of the municipal stabilization grant, and that's going into ECS. And see where the five, 16, which really after holdbacks, that's like 475. Um, wiped out for next year. Um, our cost driver is very similar to the Board of Ed is personnel. Uh, we have people that do things for people um, that cost uh, money every year. 
Um, health, retiree health insurance, the cost of that is going up about $216,000. Uh, health insurance for active employees, as Mr. Emmett said, uh, is about six, six and a half percent. Um, that number is still moving. We hope to finalize the number. We'll have to by the time we adopt the budget. Uh, the MDC uh, has increased 9.72 percent, or 355000 dollars for next year. Um, low SIP, which is a program we put in our CIP for road improvements, has been reduced by a hundred and. $22,000. Now, in order to spend the same amount of money on road repairs next year, uh, we have replaced that loss with local dollars. Um, and then increased mandates from the state of Connecticut, uh, very similar to what's going on on the board side. Um, you can see uh, this chart shows the ECS grant as a percent of the education budget. I know it's kind of hard to read a little bit, but in FY 2011, the ECS grant was providing 16.5% of our education funding. Next year, it's projected to be 14.6%. As we spoke earlier, the MDC, as, uh, as a percent of the total town increase, not including the Board of Ed, but as a percent of the total town increase, the MDC's $345,000 makes up 24% of that increase. Almost a quarter of the increase is due to the MDC. Um, fund balance is an important measure, particularly after the 2008 um, Great Recession. Rating agencies want to see uh, stable, if not growing, um, fund balances. We uh, try to stay between 10 and 11 percent, and based upon the budget and our expected revenues and expenses, we anticipate as of June 30th, 2019, to have a 10.6% uh, fund balance. Um, pension liability assets and funded ratios. You can see from the chart, if you look at 2019, um, we're getting there. As we've closed the pension plan to all groups except the police department over time, those asset values and funded ratios will continue to merge. Uh, right now, we stand at about 80% funded in our defined benefit pension plan. OPEB liability. OPEB stands for other post-employment benefits, which are primarily retiree health benefits. This is a, a new commitment on behalf of the town, not a new commitment to offer, but a new commitment uh, to fund in a trust. Um, we've collected monies for years towards this goal, but we've uh, started a trust fund about seven years ago. Um, you can see from 2019, our asset values are growing. Um, part of the budget process is to increase the amount of money we put in the trust between the town and the board by $200,000. Uh, next year's uh, commitment will be $1.2 million into the fund of new money. Um, so our commitment grows each year. Um, as you can see from the line that goes across, let me get back there. The line that goes across the numbers at the top of the bar are actually representing the percentage funded of the fund. So next year we're standing at uh, 30% in 2019. Um, each year we have a $900,000 or so capital improvement program that covers everything but roads, uh, roads and fleet vehicles. You can see from the list, drainage, uh, we have an issue up on Ridge Road. We're going to fix some fire safety issues, uh, crack seal for parking lots. Uh, we're going to reconstruct the basketball court in the rear of Charles Wright. Uh, tennis court resurfacing, community center, replace chairs and drapes, playground equipment, uh, carpet and uh, tile at some of the elementary schools, uh, additional security enhancements, ADA panels, sidewalk repairs, um, we're going to finish up the salt shed project at physical services. We have a salt shed that uh, we, we swear there's uh, Mayflower carved in the side of the boards holding it up. <laughs> but uh, we have approval to move forward with that from all our permitting agencies, or most of them, so we want to do that this summer. Uh, we're going to re-roof the Solomon Wells House, which is one of the most important historic assets in the town and gets well used by the public. And we have a heating and air conditioning repair project at the police station to do. 
Um, as I said earlier, town charter section 706 requires the town council to adopt a budget by May 15th of each year. And tonight is the public hearing on the budget at which uh, the public can be heard. Uh, if you're not able to make it tonight, please email comments in or write in or phone in. Uh, comments are accepted anytime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll remind members of the public again that we have a sign-up sheet on the side table. If you'd like to speak tonight, please sign in. And we will begin with public comment in just a minute. According to our rules and procedures, the public has 10 minutes to speak on the budget when all present wishing to speak spoken. Um, members of the public will be given another 10 minutes to speak on the budget. Thank you. We have a short list tonight. Um, the first speaker is Doreen Ciarcia. If you would please come up. Make sure you speak into the microphone, please. Good evening, Doreen Ciarcia, 194 Garden Street. I am the chair of the Weather Show Library Board and I'm addressing you tonight in that capacity and in support of the library's budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, it does increase um, by 2.5%, all of which is due to the health insurance, and you heard Jeff reference that uh, in his presentation. Our health insurance increases by over $49,000. However, the portion of the library budget that has to do with library services stays in effect the same. There's, there's no increase to that part of the budget. And I'm a week late. Last week was National Library Week. So actually it just ended, I think, Saturday. So I'm not that late. But um, we have a great resource in our library. And we certainly know we've got difficult budget decisions to make, difficult budget times. But I wanted to just give a very brief kind of um, little info session, I promise brief, about the library and some of the things we do with the amount of money that we have. Um, the proposed budget would be just over $2 million at $2,018,891. <coughs> so within that, we have, and we would seek to maintain our current services, of course, um, but we have about 400 patrons who come into the library every day and, and use that. And in terms of some statistics, through February, so July to February. We're still working on crunching March, but through February, we've loaned out over 191,000 items. We've had just under 32,000 in-house wireless, in-house and wireless computer sessions. So this number of sessions um, that we have had, so almost 32,000 from July to February, users coming in to use the internet or the, or the actual computers there. Our librarians have processed over 28,000 requests for information. And in February alone, we ran 53 programs. Now remember, February is a short month. 53 programs, which we had 1,245 people attend. Uh, we also have meeting rooms. And for 230 reservations, we had over 1,300 people attend. So certainly, it's a busy place. Certainly, it's a welcoming place for everybody in town to come. And we certainly are very aware of the budget situation and we seek to make the most of the budget that we do have. And I think you can tell from some of those statistics that we really do uh, make the most of it. We're open seven days a week from September to June, which is about 58 hours a week. So we're not talking about a regular 40 hour work week, so to speak, we're, we're considerably more than that. So um, I thank you very much for your time and I hope you all do support the library budget. Thank you, Doreen. Our next speaker is Bob Woodward. Thank you. My name is Bob Woodward. I have lived at 456 Middletown Avenue in Wethersfield for 40 years now. And I will dub that part of Middletown Avenue right now Nightmare on Middletown Avenue. And I will come back to that because if you pay the MDC what you want, you're all fools. Absolutely. I don't think you know how much town land they have taken down there and you should be collecting rent from them. Absolutely. But first let me talk about the mill rate. The mill rate absolutely frightens me. 
Last year, someone stood up here and said there are only 11 or 12 other towns and cities in this state that have a mill rate of over 40. You are joining Hartford. You know what the situation in Hartford is. You are joining um, New Britain, which has stuck at 50 for some time now. You are joining Torrington, which is high 40s, and a good friend of ours who's lived there all his life says we can't even get our streets paved anymore. And you are joining West Hartford. And as much as people think West Hartford is a town to be in, here's some comments from the paper about their mill rate. Just spend less. A 35-year resident said, no longer an affordable place to live, rein in spending. Someone else who, would, who only lived in the town for two years said, this is not sustainable. It will make the town less affordable for families to live in town. Can we get this mill rate down to what it is now or less and say something to all the people in this town, not just the people in the 5% or the 1% of income that Wethersfield is indeed for all of us? Can we get this mill rate down and find out that we'll fill some of the vacancies on Silas Dean Highway and the old nursing home up on Jordan Lane, which is sitting there half boarded up, and get some businesses back which will increase the taxes to the town. Ponder those questions. It's hard to live with less income. I agree the state is dead broke and that's why they're doing what they're doing. They're not going to get any better, at least not right now. But when you have less money, you simply have to say, how do we deal with it? My wife's small part-time job was eliminated at the end of the past year. We're dealing with 8% less income for this year and we just have to deal with it. There's nobody we can tax to get that income back. Let me move on to Nightmare on Middletown Avenue, which also includes a building that you gave a tax rebate to, the board before you were elected, and I question the ethics of that, that it should have come to this board, which was about to be elected. You gave them a, mil a tax rebate to the old laser tag building, the Borden building, which is going to be reconstructed. If you had come down and walked around the corner and come up Mill Street to Middletown Avenue or down Mill Street the other way, you would have an idea of what's going on. And if you would come and live there for a while, you'd find out what it's like with the noise, the vibration, the dust, the trucks that park and block access to our mailboxes and our trash. We have to go out and advocate for ourselves. They know that. They know that I will because I've done it to them enough. And you'd find out how much town property they have actually taken. They have blocked Mill Street, uh, Middletown Avenue at Mill Street. They have sections of Mill Street blocked. So Mill Street is down to a one-way street at one point. We have a traffic light there. We had the same thing going up Middletown Avenue to Rocky Hill. That has recently opened to two-way traffic. We have places in front of people's houses where they have taken property right on the edge <coughs> of the street because they will be doing things. They have pipes, they have equipment, they have all kinds of things on town property. They bring in all kinds of vehicles and park them during the day on uh, Mayfair and Casey Lane. You should be charging them rent, not paying more money to them. Some of their people have been very good to work with. Some of them just come in, do their job, and it's like we don't even live there. And my wife made a comment to me not so long ago, none of our houses are worth anything anymore because we couldn't sell them. Because nobody would be, everyone would be afraid to come into the neighborhood. They wouldn't know how to get through the lights and half, some of the houses, including ours, have these nice Halloween colored barriers in front of them. Nobody would want to buy our houses. We deserve the tax rebate, not the Borden building, and we deserve about a 75% tax rebate. I'm serious. And you'd have to know what it's like just by living there. You couldn't come down and walk through and say, oh, gee, we feel sorry for you. You have to live there. Right now, thankfully, they have moved away from our house. They've gone to somewhere else. They are also working on the other side of Mill Street, the west side. The other thing that this town is responsible for down there is the east side of Mill Street. You let it go, you let it go, you never paved it, 
And yes, the water company has cut it up. But in 2010, you repaved part of Middletown Avenue from Mill Street to the overpass. The water company has dug that up and repaved it. But by being repaved so recently, the part that the town repaved acted as a buffer and things are better to drive on. It's kind of like baking bread. If you put it in a pan, you got to have sides on the pan. By ignoring the east side of Mill Street, that's coming apart. The water company said to me, one of their people said to me uh, a week or so ago, will it make it through another year, another winter? That's a good question. But we're driving cars over that, and those cars are bouncing and banging and everything else, and you ignored the east side of Mill Street. You'd come down and patch it in the spring because the water was taking holes out of it. But it needs to be fixed. We need a tax rebate until this project is over. And actually, we need a tax refund from this past year because the project started. And I hope you can consider those things. The young people of Parkland, Florida showed us courage. I hope you'll pick up some of that courage, look at this mill rate, and do your best to come down under 40 so that it will speak to everyone that we are welcome in Wethersfield, that we can afford to live in Wethersfield, and that businesses can afford to come to Wethersfield. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Tom Mazzarella. Good evening, Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walcott Hill Road. I spent the last few weeks going over the two budget proposals that we just saw tonight. I started taking a bunch of notes and jotting down some numbers and things like that. Started roughing out what I wanted to say tonight. And I said to myself, what's the point? It, it looks exactly like the last three budget hearings that I spoke at. I had written down almost verbatim. It's like the superintendent and the town manager both have a playbook and the numbers just get adjusted a little bit here and there. And then we have this annual town public hearing where less than one-tenth of one percent of the town's population gets their five minutes to speak. Or ten and then another ten. I wasn't aware of that. But <laughs> stand corrected. I would have wrote more if I knew. <laughs> That's why we didn't tell you, Tom. <laughs> Then the nine members of the town council will have a series of meetings and uh, discussions with the various departments. And you're going to come up with, in my opinion, a meaningless one or two hundred thousand dollar reduction in a hundred and five million dollar budget. Something needs to change. The rate of growth in town spending and resultant increase in our mill rate is unsustainable. It's no different than what we're seeing at the state level. Out of town revenue you know, from the state will most likely continue to decrease. It's not going to increase. The situation is only going to get worse. It's time to face facts. Weathersfield is near fully built. There is never going to be a significant increase in the grand list. What are we looking at this year? 0.38% of growth in the grand list. And when we do get a development or two, such as the uh, couple uh, apartment developments, we defer any meaningful benefit in the form of multi-year tax abatements. It's not gonna help us in the near term future. You can't keep asking taxpayers to come up with more. Eventually, taxpayers will have no more to give. <clears throat> and many town residents, I think, are at the breaking point. These folks are probably not in attendance tonight. I'm speaking for the many young families where both parents must work extended hours just to make ends meet. I'm speaking about those seniors and others that are on fixed income that are struggling. Just look at the number of families that rely on our town food bank. It continues to increase, not decrease. People are hurting, and people that are hurting don't want to come out in a public forum and say, hey, I'm broke, I can't, I can't even afford groceries, never mind 
$266 uh, tax increase. This is serious. And the numbers are increasing each year. We need to get our heads out of the clouds and face the facts. I hate to get up here and speak negatively about our town. I, lo I love this town. But we are in a downward spiral. spiral. People will leave. Property values will decrease. Higher taxes will make the town less attractive for businesses as well as new families that are looking for a place to make a home. We need to reduce our spending and maintain a mill rate of 40 mills or less. The Board of Ed budget must be reduced to the state mandated MBR level of 57 million. The school system continues to spend a disproportionate amount of taxpayer dollars on a declining enrollment. The chart that was in the presentation, the historical budget increase, failed to show the 3.49 of where it's going to. They managed to operate the school system last year with a 0.42% increase over the prior year budget. The world didn't end. Everybody still graduated. Things were good. You just have to tighten the budget. On the town side, I suggest uh, that you could obtain a 4 to 5% budget reduction from each department. Set the rules. This is what we need to do. You may also look at reducing the fund balance, perhaps dropping it as low as 9%. It's going to affect our bond rating, but we're not planning on taking any more bonds out in the near future, I hope. We must change our ways. It's up to the town council to set the necessary changes into motion. The town manager and indirectly the superintendent's budgets both report to the nine council members. They are supposed to be the implementers of the plan. You nine are supposed to provide the direction of where the town's headed. If you approve the budget as presented, you send a message to each town department and to the Board of Ed that it's business as usual and just continue to spend and spend. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Tom. Gus, Colantonio. Good evening, Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue. Uh, I was not ready to speak, but I'm going to say a few words anyway. And uh, the gentleman has been here for 40 years. Well, I've been here for 45 years. I've been paying taxes since then, since 1973. Everything has been going up. There is not even one year where the taxes went down that I can remember. There is something wrong with the society the way I see it. The tax keep on going up, 3.5%. Society itself, it seems that they are the public employees, and not just in the town. You know, you take the town, you take the state, you take the federal, and then there is the rest of us. The rest of us live in a real world. You guys do not. Just to get a raise, and most of the money doesn't really go to the kids. It goes to salaries, benefits, and health care. I worked for 37 years, and I'm getting $77 a month for pension. Now, am I complaining? No, I'm just making a statement. It was by choice. But it seems to me that where we need the unions the least is where we have it the most. Now, why there are so many, well, everybody that works for the government, I guess they have the unions. In private, the unions are disappearing. Why? You wonder why? This kind of society has to be together. It cannot be some people have it all the time without accountability and people work two jobs just to, to, get, you know, to pay the expenses. Where are we going to go? Take for instance now, you know, the, the way things are going are bad. And I've, I've been here again for 45 years. On my street and, and the surrounding areas, we have about 10 houses for sale. When the supply is so much and the demand is low, the price is going to go down done, all right? But the mill rate, it doesn't. So where is it going to go? 
at three and a half percent, where I only got probably one and a half, two percent worth of Social Security, how much longer can I stay around and pay the expenses that keep on going up? Do you ever ask yourself questions like that? I don't think so. You know why? Because you guys in public, you're, you do not have any accountability at all. The only reason you do that job is because of the money coming in and the easiness to get it. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. <clears throat> Casey White. Hello, Casey White, <clears throat> 91 Center Street. Um, I want to thank all the counselors here tonight. Um, seeing in the budget the numbers of how much money we've lost in the state is really scary, and I know this is not an, an easy task. Um, and I agree with some of the other commenters that I, we, I want to keep Weathersfield affordable for families and for seniors and for everyone who has lived here and has given to the community. Um, people shouldn't feel forced out. Um, but um, I also want to speak in favor of some services that I appreciate in town and also some ways that I think we can reposition ourselves to think about how we're bringing in revenue and bringing in people from outside of town to spend money here, to open businesses here, because I think that is a key. As was mentioned, there's not a lot of empty space to build new buildings in town. We really need to capitalize on the resources we have. And I see a lot of those resources as being historic, natural, and community-oriented. I moved here from Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is an urban um, city. I lived within walking distance of pretty much everywhere I needed to go. I could take a train. Obviously, Weathersfield is not um, a large city like Cambridge. But the reason I chose Weathersfield with my family to move here was because it felt kind of like Cambridge and Boston. It felt like a very comfortable place where people could walk. I love seeing people out walking and biking. Um, I live in the historic district, and it is a treasure that cannot be manufactured to have old buildings, old streetscapes, old design that people have developed over hundreds of years. Um, it's a really special place. We have the cove. Um, even, honestly, Millwoods having a swimming pond. I grew up in <coughs> Texas. That's really special to me. That's a, a wonderful resource. And I think that um, building on all of these things to increase um, community in Mother's Field, increase uh, its attractiveness to outside families. I mean, I could tell driving through the neighborhood that I wanted to move here. I didn't want to move to West Hartford. I didn't want to move to Glastonbury. Uh, which is where people assumed that my family would move. Um, so I think looking at some small, looking at small ways that we can make changes. Um, at Millwoods, I like that there's a place for snacks now. What if we had a snack vendor there? Maybe a local business. Maybe we increase fees to the pool. It's not a lot of money, but it's such a wonderful place that the more people build community, Things happen and things grow, and that's what you see in urban areas like Cambridge, where I moved from. Um, in terms of the historic district and pedestrian life and non-car ways of getting around in town, I think that we really can look at a long-term view of how are we developing Silestine Highway, um, how are we connecting Weathersfield across this road that's really designed for cars. Um, Town Hall doesn't, you can't access it from the road from Silas Dean. But it, that, this is the path that connects neighborhoods and I hardly ever see people walking across Silas Dean unless there's someone clearly in a different economic level than I am who's taking the bus and is kind of forced by circumstance to be on that street. But what if we found ways to encourage businesses to come there to open bookstores, cafes, um, things that will bring people out bring out people with strollers, bring out people on bikes. This is going to attract new residents. This would um, bring in people from outside towns. I feel like a lot of people in Mothersfield go elsewhere to eat out, to enjoy things, to have fun. And we really could do a lot with what we have here. Um, I, I would be in favor of putting in parking meters in some of the denser parts of Weathersfield. Um, I think we can really treat ourselves as a city that's a destination for people. I'm a millennial. I, some of you may or may not know a television show famous for a charming Connecticut town that a family lived in. And um, it's fiction, but a lot of people have connected with that 
idea of community and a quaint historic town. There's a town in Connecticut that's actually brought in people who've flown in for a festival to celebrate this idea of this fictional town. Um, and so television aside, I think having a more playful approach to our identity as a town would help attract younger families. It would help bring in people from outside Weathersfield. Um, I just really think that we have so much to work with and looking toward ways that we can you take advantage of our resources will um, help us in the long run. It would be an investment in the town. Um, in addition to that, I, I want to say that I'm in favor of the library budget. I think that's really reasonable. Um, I understand that most of this, the budget increases in here are due to fixed costs and increasing um, liabilities. So that's not things we can necessarily just cut out. Um, I also, I'm in favor of actually amending, as recommended in the budget, the policy for the unassigned fund balance. Um, I think we should have a good bond rating. That's important. And my child goes to Hanmer, which I think is maybe at some point going to need changes and updates. So I don't think um, our bond rating is something we can go to sleep on um, and set aside. Those are some of my thoughts tonight. Um, Thank you again, and I also want to thank, shout out to all the volunteer firefighters, because that is really crazy to me that our firefighters are not paid staff. Um, so that's amazing. Thank you to everyone who volunteers their time um, for that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> that concludes our list. Are there other members of the public who would like to speak that have not signed up? Mr. Young, come on up. Good evening, Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. We citizens have had a very difficult seven years living here in the state of Connecticut and Weathersfield. We've seen politically connected people, and I'm not gonna mention the names even though I have them written down, that have received great jobs, great benefits, and all at the cost of us including you folks. I take great offense from all of that bad stuff that has happened up at the state capitol, and it's now filtered down to us. We've endured state, huge state increases in the billions of dollars, not once, not twice. I believe it's more than that, especially with the last little hit that we got. And, and, and it's all because of that huge appetite, the total mismanagement of the state of Connecticut. And it filters down to here, total mismanagement here in Weathersfield as well, because you folks do what they do. And now you have us in one hell of a pickle. We're looking at less and less money, and we're looking at all kinds of gimmicks to find dollars to help fund this big appetite. Just recently, this week, last week, I don't know which it was, State of Connecticut had where the Labor Department, in the paper where the Labor Department now is going to be charging businesses and extras X amount of dollars to every business in the state in order to carry on their labor activities at the state, up at the labor department. I received my registration for a car. I get hit with Clean Water Act of $10 on my registration. I get whacked with Connecticut <coughs> Needs a Passport to Parks of $10, and we keep getting whacked. 
and nobody cares. I have yet to hear any official from the town of Wethersfield complain to the state of Connecticut that they got to get their act together. Instead, it's all, keep your mouth shut. Don't worry about it. We'll slip whatever it is through the budget, and, and we won't have to have that conversation. And of course, we see droves of people leaving the state, leaving people leaving Wethersfield. Adios, amigo, is what they're saying. And off they go, never to come back. And they took their money. These, most of these people were producers, leaving the net effect of more non-producers, which is what we have, thanks to the way the government works. I also believe, and I've mentioned many times from this podium, we need transparency from the town of Wethersfield, something that's totally ignored. We should be able to see the checkbook of our town online. And I invite you, and I will send you a link, not tonight, but maybe tomorrow, of the town of East Hartford that has a very good website showing their checkbook. If you go to the state of Connecticut, Kevin Limbaugh, was he, controller, controller for the state of Connecticut, has developed a beautiful, easy going, easy to find transparency website that's available to every citizen that wants to go and log on and look and see how they're spending money. How they're spending money? how the payroll is being spent, how the assets are being bought, everything is in there, and all their expenditures. We don't have that in Wethersfield. I've asked about that more than once. But we have better ways of spending our money. We also have losses left and right in this town. You know, I've complained over the last number of years about the Kinney Center, about the Standish House. We should have just recently negotiated the rent on the Standish House and the Kinney Center, but our town council didn't do a darn thing. They walk away with uh, $43,000 a year, the Wethersfield Historic Society does, for a, a cool investment of $100 a year. I think that's so <laughs> disgraceful. I mean, Mr. Mr. Forrest is one that signed up for it. He voted for it, 50-year lease, and there were more. Yet now the chickens or the, the roosters have come to roost, and we're in financial trouble. If we continue to own the Keeney Center, the Board of Education could have used that for their transitional academy. It's on a bus line, has an elevator, the town is paying for all the utilities. What the heck? Why, why are we renting something on the Silas Dean Highway for fifty-two or $53,000 a year? It's $4,750 $4, a month. Plus, we're paying the utilities there. Why are we doing this? Did anybody, when, when the Board of Education came in with this great idea for a transitional academy, there was never any discussion on how we're going to pay for it. No, keep it quiet. Slide it into the budget. Slide it into the budget. We have more things going on that the earlier councils, and there's people sitting here who were part of, part of that, should have said no. But no, we're, it, you put us in a bind. And now we're in the bind. And what are we going to do? What the heck are we going to do? You know, down in Shelton, and I mentioned this at the last meeting, Mark Loretti, he promises Shelton no mill increase, rate increase, for 10 consecutive years. Hear that? He promises Shelton no mill rate increase 
for 10 consecutive years. He hasn't raised the mill rate. <clears throat> and he's been running a city or a town, whatever it is. And he's doing well. They love him. He talks in this article about how, forget financing of uh, 30 years, do it as short as term as possible and keep turning it over and keep moving on. But we, we, we tie ourselves up with forever. Forever. But I really think that's an article, Mayor, you should read. I'll, maybe I'll send it to you. Now, I did tell you, yeah, okay, we're done with that. Now, we you have your budget. I've noticed you used to talk about the grand list. The grand list increased by 0.38. I believe the year before it mentions 2.7, 2.07. Extremely small increases. We need to find ways of reducing our costs, council members. And I, with such a low increase in productivity coming from our grand list, we should be looking at who's responsible for that. And the ones that come to my mind is your planning, in, your planning officers or officer, the one who's deals with bringing in businesses. Obviously, the few businesses that are coming in are, are just not cutting it. And maybe that's where we should start a cut going forward in order to save money. Instead of raising taxes, Tony, you know? You have a lot of long-term debt. You have long-term debt that, uh, well, first of all, let me just say something that pokes out at me on this budget. On page number four, um, middle of the page, it says, it is clear that without a new source of revenue, the property tax will have to be continually increased to pay for these obligations. This is in the long-term financial area. Then on the next page, it says, without a new source of revenue, it can be expected that the property tax will have to continue to increase to meet these retirement obligations. Mr. Not Young? a single word about how we can cut costs. It's how to increase revenues onto the citizens of this community. Mr. Young, your first, 10 minutes, are, your first 10 minutes are up. Let me see if anyone else would like to speak. Then we'll have you back up. Is there anybody? Oh, Dave. Good evening, David Kirk, 149 Broad Street. Um, I uh, was looking at the budget. It doesn't go into too much detail. Um, I was listen listening to some, one of, some of the other speakers, uh, what they were saying, and I, I, uh, I agree with one thing the last speaker said. He said that uh, the state elected officials mismanaged our, uh, our money, and, uh, and I agree, and, and, and he didn't use a word that I would use. I, he, he, uh, the, our, the state official, the ones we elected, put us in a financial crisis. And that's why we're in this situation now where we're getting less and we're, and we're going to have to spend more. We're going to have to tax more because of what, what the, the mess the, our leaders in the state. And uh, we'll see what happens in, a, in the next election. But um, I don't agree with him that Weathersfield uh, compares to the state as far as mismanaging our money. I think Weathersfield does the best they can with, what mon with whatever money they get. And uh, I've been following the budget over the years, and I see uh, they give the expenditures. Uh, for instance, uh, this year they, you wrote down, you, you cut down on road improvement by 122,000. Cut down on, well, we got, we're getting less. Uh, 90, we're getting, uh, I didn't put the amount. We're getting less in state uh, ECS grants from the state. And uh, I looked it up on my phone, and because that's because the state is cutting 97 million in ECS grant fundings, giving more toward uh, uh, poor performing schools or schools that are 
you know, poor in poorer towns. But um, so so what the state has done is affecting our, us. Uh, the MDC is one uh, issue that I'm I'm wondering about if they're just getting it, all they can get out of us. You know that that's a huge increase, uh, three hundred forty-seven thousand, three hundred forty-five thousand dollars increase. You know I maybe we could new, take a closer look at at that money as one of the first speakers was uh, talking about. Uh, Retiree health insurance went up $216,000. Nothing you could do about that. Uh, Board of Ed health insurance went up, it said 6.5%, $439,000. And now that's one thing I don't understand. Usually when my, when I work somewhere and the health insurance goes up, they put it on the employees. You know, we get less, we get worse insurance. We, we get higher deductibles, and we get, we get less coverage. Now, now if, if the, uh, if the uh, school employees got the same insurance, then they got a great deal. They, they had a good uh, teachers union negotiator to give them the same great deal, because that's a lot of money increase. I wonder how much, uh, well, considering I, it doesn't break it down, so I don't know how much is impacting the, um, the uh, Board of Ed budget, but I know the Board of Ed, they're not asking for all that much more. There's a lot of other things that I always wondered how much is impacting our, our uh, budget, for instance, this school, our new school. I know we're paying in off of 20 years, I think, something like that. And I know I know over the years, I remember when they first said it, we're gonna, it averages to each, each uh, taxpayer is gonna pay this amount, but it's gonna gradually go down, but that's never broken down. But, uh, and how much it's costing us, I guess you can't put every little detail, but, but uh, overall, I'm, I'm happy with what the town's doing. Uh, considering uh, the situation with our financial crisis, we're not getting as much money. We need to make cuts when we can. So um, I'm happy with what the town's doing. I don't think there's, uh, I don't agree that you are, well, there's a couple things, uh, last couple things that I disagree with. Um, someone said uh, we shouldn't give tax incentives to new businesses like the, the fund zone. Well. A lot of towns and cities all over the country is doing, are, are doing that. And that's, you know, when you have a vacant property for 20 years and you can't get anyone to go there, give them an a, a, a incentive to bring some business here because we're not making it much from, for taxes out of an, uh, a vacant building. So we want to get new businesses in our vacant properties. And if it takes a tax incentive to do it, fine with me because a vacant building is not bringing in much money to our town. And, and the last thing, and I think that is the last thing. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you. <clears throat> is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Come on up. Please state your name. Hi, I'm Marjorie Carson. I'm 12 Avalon Place. I wasn't going to speak tonight because my back is killing me because my basement was flooded. <laughs> by all the torrential downpour today. Um, but I decided I came anyway, and I decided to say a few words. Um, I just want to say overall I do support the Board of Edge budget. I, I would say that there have been cuts to the last budget, given how much money we lost and how many positions we couldn't fill. So I think that to say we just keeps increasing and we're spending, 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 there have been cuts. Um, and I don't want us to become a state like Kentucky or other or other areas where you cut so much that <coughs> teachers um, have to buy way more materials for them for their classrooms. There's an um, interesting article in the New York Times today where they just ask teachers from all over the country to send in conditions of your classroom or things that you buy or textbooks, and it was unbelievable. Some teachers making only 40 grand, and they had been working for 20 years in some states um, where they're buying like a thousand to two thousand dollars worth of materials. So sometimes that ends up being the uh, repercussions of cutting too much uh, from your Board of Ed budgets or you know, um, laying off teachers. Um, but I also want to say on the set town side, one of the things about the Board of Ed side, I've noticed there's a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of collaboration, and they seem to be really planning a lot um, and thinking about collaborating with other towns um, and just understanding how we have to start thinking regionally and um, working collaboratively and thinking ahead, five years ahead, 10 years ahead, which Given the budget issues, it, it's hard to be that positive, but I think the, the reality is there. Um, and they're trying to think of other ways, think of other solutions with Bobby and Superintendent and you know, other Board of M members. And on the, on the town side, that's what I'd like to see more of. I feel like there's a lot of, and it's hard because of the budget issues. I think instead of reacting 
to just every year things that are happening. I'd like to see more planning out, and not just a plan that sits on the shelf for five years, but planning and implementing. Um, whether it's collaborating with other towns, grant you know, hiring people to grant get grants, or having people that work here um, work for us, also do some more grant writing, getting money from other sources. I know it's tough. Grants are tough because they they're only limited in time. But we need to start thinking about other sources of money. We can't just rely on the state and, and the town uh, taxpayers for, for, the, for uh, these increases. And when it comes to roads and any special projects, and again, like with Casey saying, the stylistic highway, oh, I wish there was some sort of plan that we could just start implementing to make that more attractive, especially around the town hall area, connecting it to um, Old Weathersfield, up all the way to Wilka Hill. It would be such a huge thing because honestly, when you're that most people drive down the Silestine Highway from other towns, that's all they see. There's not one. T there's like one tiny sign that actually tells you to go to Old, Old Weathersfield. That's it. They don't even know how to get there. Um, come off the highway, it's hard to tell where Old Weathersfield is. And I think you could make part of the Silestine Highway connect all that. And how? Why am I saying this? I just feel like that investment would pay so much towards business development. People tr being attracted to the Silestine Highway at a business level. Um, if you build it, I think they will come. I think if you make it more um, um, friendly as far as pedestrian, um, narrowing of lanes, traffic, more traffic calming, just, I mean, and just like the one section in there where they call it town center, the town hall, library, Corpus Christi, you know, all that stuff, so that area, I think if you just planned out to make it more um, of attractive area, that you could bring more businesses to that, to that road. Um, but I also want to say that you know there are, compared to other towns, we are affordable. I hear so many people tell me that. I know it's hard to, to believe because everything's going up and up and up, but I know there's so many other towns that are way more expensive than ours. There are so many people I know in this town that are teachers, and teachers move here because it's affordable. Teachers don't make a lot of money. Um, and um, I, I, I understand costs going up for people is not, um, especially for people on a limited income, it's really tough. And, it, it, and I do wonder if it's sustainable. But, um, but I do know that we are considered still an affordable town as far as um, the, the real estate we offer, the, the, the housing we offer, the prices we offer, the, t the great schools we have. Um, I still love our town. I just think there are definitely assets, like Casey was saying, that we don't really cherish enough and that we could invest more in. And I know that means money, but it also could just mean you know, thinking outside of the box, collaborating with other people. Um, that's my statement. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak tonight? Anybody else? I'd like to come back up for a minute. Or okay, yep, yeah, just as soon as everybody else is, okay, there's nobody else in the office but in the audience? Okay, then come on back up, Mr. Woodward. Thank you. There's one more level of government to bring into this, too. Federal government, beginning January 1st, has a new IRS plan. There is a cap on the amount of state and local taxes that we might deduct of $10,000, if I understand what I'm reading. The more we put our taxes up, the harder it's going to be for all of you and all of us to stay under that cap. Please think about that. Thank you. Anybody else would like to speak for a second time? Mr. Young? Oh. Good evening again. Robert Young, 20 Copper Mill Road. We're all aware of how bad things are in Connecticut, yet here are the the state of Connecticut, University of Connecticut, I should say, is floating a $300 million bond. Isn't that great? City of Hartford to pay, pay $6.5 million in housing case. You know who's going to pay for that? Us. Dillon Stadium gets $10 million from the state. You know who's going to take care of that for you? Us. Malloy defends Hartford bailout. You know who's going to pay for all of that for the next 20 or 30 years? Us. And then, of course, with all the hard times up there in Hartford, $14 million is okayed for Infosys expansion. 
more handouts. And while all these handouts are going on, there's a crumbling foundation legislation going on up in Hartford. It's called SB 377. And they want to add a $10 fee on new and renewed mortgage loans that come that are after July 1st, 2018. They want to require insurance companies to pay a $10 fee on all new or renewed homeowners or rental insurance policies after July 1st, 2018. Add a $10 surcharge on new or renewed homeowners and rental insurance policies after July 1st, 2018. And that fee shall be sunsetted June 30th, 2025. Aren't these great guys? And they're going to hit everybody. And they'll get it passed. Now, $10 doesn't seem like much. We know that. But that's not the issue. The issue is using our personal insurance policies as a conduit to draw money to support any state of Connecticut legislation now or in the future. Today, it is our homeowner's insurance. Tomorrow, it could be our health insurance to bail out the state health care cost. You know, all the, for the people who are on the low end of the scale, we might have to get all hit with some kind of fees to keep them going. And it just goes on and on, Mayor. This has to stop. Okay, I'm going to get back into the budget. You have this, this uh, headline um, header on page three, intro. Uh, grand list. You talk about the uh, 0.38 increase of the grand list. And uh, you talk about the sales of homes and the, the values of homes. I really think you should add to that the number and the dollar amount, if you can, average, of the foreclosures that we've had in, sale, in, in the town of Wethersfield. I think foreclosures is one heck of a metric that we should be looking at. You should have been looking at it for years, but we didn't look at it, did we? You know, you complain about your costs for um, uh, benefits. You could complain in here about the MDC increasing the, the amount of money of $345,000 or 9.72%. I'd like that to say what the dollar amount is that we're really paying them after that. You do that on the next page. But it, we citizens, we all have the same problem paying that bill. The only thing is, I believe, and I'm not sure, but you don't pay taxes. Town doesn't pay taxes on your bills. We citizens, we pay taxes. Towns are exempt. So when, you're, when your water bill is $100, everybody out here is 115 because of all the taxes, or 120. Let's give that a little thought, too. You're exempt from taxation. You have um, you had a circuit breaker I want to talk about tonight. The elderly circuit breaker. And you have renter's rebate. I'm not too familiar with any of them because I don't qualify for any of them. But I really believe that if the, town, if the state of Connecticut is not funding their share, the town of Wethersfield should not be funding it either. <clears throat> they have no excuse at the, at the state level to say you didn't carry on what you were supposed to carry on. This is an extremely small minority. I hate to go after the seniors because I'm one myself. But I also believe that it's a very small percent of loss for them and the rest of us should not be paying for that. We never should have been paying for that. They should be standing on their own. And if you can't stand on your own, I don't know. I don't see where someone else should support you. And that's really what's going on here. And um, so I, I would, you know, I, my suggestion is we should discontinue the elderly circuit breaker and we should eliminate the, uh, the renter's rebate. I think if you continue on with it, the state of Connecticut doesn't pony up their piece. That would be looked upon in a very ill fashion. 
as buying votes. So I would really consider that. Now, there's more things I'd like to talk about. Long-term capital investments, but I think we're going to hold that off. I think because I haven't said a word about the Board of Education. Um, I think the Board of Education costs have been going up year after year at a big gallop compared to inflation ever since I've been coming here. 15 years, whatever years it is, I don't even know anymore. It just keeps rising and rising. And does it help the children? I think that's the question. Does it help the children? Or does it pay salaries and benefits? Because I believe that's really where it's all going. Salaries and benefits. Very little to the children. So I really think we need to look at that and scale back that entire budget in the Board of Education. Because they've been living the gravy train all these years. The town side has been taken to hammering. Look what happened when you had a ECS money reduction from the state of Connecticut. We took more, than, this, the town side took what? More than half? And less than half went to the Board of Ed to be, uh, be resolved. We're always taking the hit. And it's about time you people stand up for, for the rest of us. You know, there's something called equality. There is no equality here, the way it's been going. The people with the circuit breaker, it's not equality for them. I mean, how few do you really have on the circuit breaker versus the number of seniors that you have? I'm sure the number, I don't know what the number is. Maybe the manager could tell us someday. And how about the renters? of whatever they get for the rent rebate. I don't even understand that. But why would they get a, they're renting. That's their choice. Why would they get a rebate? And since this, and the state was paying it all along with, I guess they were paying it 100%, I don't know. But now you're saying in here that we're gonna pay half of it. Or are we gonna pick up the whole thing in your budget? $350,000, are we picking that up? Is that 100%? You don't have to answer it. You know, I understand. You know, I also look at, the, at the, um, these schedules in the back. Summary of capital budgets. And you know, I see in here for, the, of course it's not this year, it's the year 2001. You plan on spending $90,000 on a fence at Catone Field, the bankrupt site. What the heck is, what kind of a fence did we put up in the beginning to now be requiring a $90,000 fence? Did trees fall on it from some storm? Or are the kids climbing over it and breaking it? You know, you have the Nature Center. You're now talking about $90,000 for windows. I mean, there's other windows you're talking about too in here. That really, um, windows at the Webb School. That's been on the, the drawing board since it was renovated. You had all the money back then to renovate that school. And you didn't do the windows. That's 10, how many years ago? 10 years, 15 years ago? And you've been having those lousy old windows, which was uh, one of the reasons you were gonna renovate the school? Do we call this, man how do we call this as far as management goes? And then I saw something else that really caught Mr. my Young, eye. Mr. Young, your 10 I minutes are up. Yeah, you know, Mayor, I'll, I'll be back, you know. And okay. we'll be continuing talking about this. But you've got some ugly things in here, and you've got some ugly things to take care of. And one of them is to straighten out our state of Connecticut. You know, we, we citizens who work, we spend, we send approximately $90 million a year to the state of Connecticut. Thank there are you for so your many comments, taxes. Mr. Young. There's 40 to 50 taxes. And in that, we, spend, we send all that money 
and we only get back eight million dollars nine million dollars thank you very much is there anybody else who'd like to speak for a second time mr mazzarella come on up Tom Mazzarella, 600 Walker Hill Road. I'll try to be brief. I just wanted to address a couple comments that were made tonight by some of the residents. <clears throat> One was the development or improvement of the Silestine Highway. And I just wanted to share with everybody that there is a plan that was developed uh, which uh, called for more walkability and more shops and local attractions and it mentioned the blueback square type atmosphere uh, possibly uh, center islands to slow the traffic down and things of that nature in particular they mentioned the town center which is a strip of land that goes roughly from the town hall to uh, chamberlain road where the car wash is and uh, just recently, we took that plan that was uh, put together on the recommendations of the town residents surveyed and professionals and town employees, a very nice report. And we chose to revise that zone to allow for a dispensary, which is now going to be applied for uh, in a little shopping plaza uh, just uh, from Wells, south of Wells Road which in my opinion is not gonna be a walkable type venue where you can stroll down there with your kids and maybe it could have been a mazzucato bakery or something as such like that or a little restaurant or maybe a gift shop or something, I don't know. But I don't think uh, dispensary was what we were looking for. So there is a plan, but the plan is fluid. And it changes depending on, you know, how the wind blows. Secondly, I wanted to comment about teacher salaries. There is this conception, misconception, that teachers don't make very much. Well, my dad was a teacher. And uh, he retired some 20-something, almost 30 years ago. And, yeah, he didn't make very much money as a, as a school teacher. A uh, matter of fact, at one point in my career, I... I think I outpaced him in my salary, which was, you know, hard for him to swallow, I'm sure. And then at one point, the state decided we have to really up the, up the pay scales for teachers. And there was an across-the-board increase where teachers got, you know, ten, fifteen thousand dollar $15,000 increase. Well, let me tell you, in Weathersfield, the max teacher salary is 99000 and change. That's just their salary. That doesn't include all their benefits, which are many. It also doesn't include what they call stipends. And when I was going to school, you know, there would be different activities and such. Uh, maybe the spring production or uh, graduation ceremony or any number of things. And there would be a teacher assigned to that task to, to head up the project. And I always thought, hey, this guy's a great guy. He's helping out with this project or, or this club or whatever. Well, they all get a stipend for that. They get extra money for that. And you can have an athletic coach or athletic teacher, phys ed teacher, who might happen to coach three different sports. And he's going to get five, six, seven thousand dollars $7,000 per sport on top of his maxed out salary of 99 and change. So teacher salaries are up there. Now, I don't want to mis misstate anything. That's, that's the maximum teacher salary. That's not a first-year teacher. But it is a significant cost. In, in the town uh, board of ed budget, I'm continually annoyed that that budget is not transparent. That board of ed budget should be a line-by-line -line budget presented to anybody in the town that wants to read it. And if you did read that, you'd see all kinds of numbers that just don't make any sense. Uh, Councilor Martina commented last time when the board presented, uh, I forget the line item, but there was an item that, it wasn't a very large dollar amount, but it had doubled, roughly doubled in size. And the business manager for the, for the Board of Ed said, 
Well, that number's not really real. That's a placeholder. And for anybody that doesn't know what a placeholder is, that's a number, a fictitious number that you plug into a budget so that once the budget is approved, you can use that extra money for other things that you didn't have to put down line by line. I think that kind of stuff has to stop. I looked at the budget line by line, and some of it was pretty hard to justify. Uh, one that caught my eye was $37,000 for trash bags. That's a lot of trash bags. I don't know where they're putting the trash, but that's a lot of trash bags. Another item that caught my attention was postage. $40,000 for postage. That's 80,000 stamps. Yet they only had 1,000 envelopes in the budget. Where's all the stamps going? I mean, that may seem petty, but when you looked at the budget line by line, you could see obvious numbers that were just, just a wing it number, a nice even 5,000 or 8,000 or 7,000. Then there was other departments within the Board of Ed that seemed to line item everything. There was even paper clips for $8 in there. So there's no consistency. I think that all that information, all the prior spending should be available to the public so they can evaluate it. Much the same way the town manager presented his budget where he showed prior year's expenditures and year-to-date spending for each line item. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Gus. Gus Colantonio, 16 Morrison Avenue again. I would like to agree with uh, the beautiful observation from, from Tom and Bob, you know. It's uh, something to think about it. Uh, the budget, you know, the only thing that basically I find it a little bit intriguing, when you drive around town, you see a lot of potholes all over creation. The roadways in the town of Wethersfield are not the best. It seems to me that when, as soon as you go to Rocky Hill, the roadways are much better. And yet, we're cutting the budget to improve the roads. The, how can that be? I mean, it seems, unless I'm misunderstood, that's where we have to spend money. The roadways is one thing that every, every resident in Westfield uses it. And yet, it seems that it doesn't really have a representation at all. It says, oh, well, we don't have money. We cut it right here. <laughs> When people come in, well, when people come in, I guess, uh, you know, the, the first thing they see is, is the roads. They say, what kind of roads do we have? Uh, another thing, you know, the, I would have to say congratulations to the library board, you know. I think the town manager, probably uh, Mr. Emmett, should, uh, should sit down with, the, with them. They have something to learn because they do the necessary things and nothing more. You know, that's, that, that's crazy, you know, the way things are going, the salary, like, you know, people complain about the salaries. Tom made good observations, you know, $100,000, it's a lot of money, okay? And they start with a lot of money right here. That's not counting the benefits, health benefits for the rest of their life. I wish I could go back probably, you know, I would do things a little bit differently. Thank you. Thank you, Gus. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Casey. Hello again, Casey White, 91 Center Street. <clears throat> um, there are a few things I wanna talk about again. Um, regarding Board of Ed budget and teacher salaries, I want our teachers to be paid well. We are living in a moment where we are seeing what happens when teacher salaries and benefits get put on the shelf for decades and cut from budgets over and over and over. Kentucky, West Virginia, Oklahoma, these walkouts are <laughs> really sh like just skimming the surface of the problems that exist in those places because of deferred um, compensation. So I want our teachers to be paid well. That, that is, should be a basic given, and I want that to continue in Weathers Field. Um, I also want to say that I really appreciate the class sizes in um, 
Weathersfield. All I know about is Hanmore, but my daughter has been in small classes of, I think, 17 kids, maybe both years she's been there. And that has such an impact on her daily life of um, having a calmer classroom, a more focused teacher, more engagement, more one-on-one -on -one time. Um, but also, as we all know, families are gonna think twice to move somewhere if class sizes are 22, 23 kids in a class, or even higher. Um, that's chaos and it just really impacts um, a child's daily life and how much they're able to learn. So I really appreciate that and that's something that I talk about a lot um, when I'm telling people about our schools. Um, I also appreciate the services in the schools. My daughter, um, as soon as she started kindergarten, was referred to speech therapy and it was such a pleasure to work with everyone at, at the school, the principal, her teacher, the wonderful speech therapist. Um, I'm tearing up just thinking about it. I saw a video today of her from two years ago and hearing the difference in her speech um, before she started kindergarten and then just within a year, she only had one year of speech therapy and it was, it's night and day, it's marvelous. And I know that that's because they had the staff, the time, the attention to give to her that kids don't get in every school. That's not a given. Um, so those are the kinds of things that should continue. They have lifelong impacts on, on children and we owe it to all of the children in Weathersfield um, to give them every advantage they can get in a reasonable, professional way. Um, the library is also a wonderful place. Um, as was mentioned, the library budget is not increasing in terms of how much they're spending on programming, um, but their programming is awesome. It's not over the top, I think it's just right. It's um, accessible, it's friendly, it's really sweet. Um, my daughter loves the different reading bingo challenges they do. Um, she liked the summer reading program and it really actually got her to the library checking out books she wouldn't have otherwise read. And um, again, those are things that impact a child for their life. And those are really important to a community. Not to mention that it's a welcoming place that anyone can come. Anyone can be literally safe, warm, dry. They can have water. They have internet access. They can look up job listings. They can get information. Uh, this is a lifeline for anyone in a community. And um, keeping it funded adequately is really, really important. Um, and to end finally again on uh, development, um, of course everything doesn't need to be a cafe or a gift shop as was stated um, a little bit disparagingly. Um, communities really do thrive when there's mixed development and a mixed transportation um, focus. And um, I think as Marjorie also said, this is something that if you build it, they will come and not just in Connecticut. I mean, I think people would come here from New York for the day, for a day trip, maybe Bless. stay overnight. That's how special Weathers Field is. And um, we can really capitalize that, on that and think creatively and think long-term in addition to um, putting Band-Aids on the short-term unknown financial situation with the state that we're in right now. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak tonight? Okay, the town clerk. I have four communications that the manager received. One was from uh, Tadri Domagala, uh, Michelle Sapaglia, Bob Gaynor, and James D. Tommaso. And they will be in the minutes. Thank you. Okay, seeing no other members of the public who would like to speak tonight, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank you. And before we um, before we end, I should just say our first budget meeting, um, budget workshop meeting, is this Wednesday, April 18th at 6:30 at the Stillman Building with the Board of Education. Good night.